Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us today as we kick off with another monthly workshop series. My name is Drew Scammell, and I'm a program associate with the Inclusive STEM Ecosystems for Equity and Diversity, or IUC program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. On behalf of our AAAS IUC initiative, I would like to welcome you to today's workshop, High Impact Pedagogies that Motivate and Retain Students in STEM. Today's workshop will feature presentations from Dr. Eliza J. Riley and Dr. Aludari Awulabi. Before we jump into the workshop today, we have a few housekeeping notes that we'll breeze through right before we get into the presentations. So if we go to the next slide, we have, so first and foremost, this presentation is being recorded and because there's a lot of attraction to this topic today, we're also live streaming this presentation to YouTube. Want to put that out there so you all are informed. The recording will be made available in the coming weeks on our website at AAAS dash ius.org and the slides are posted and available on the website if you'd like to follow along visually. You'll also receive an email with a link to the recording when it becomes available. Um, one thing to note is that as we transition into the Q&A discussion breakouts following the presentations, these breakouts will allow for deeper engagement and will not be recorded. Additionally, we have closed captioning for this workshop. You can download and view the full transcript by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you who are new to the AAAS IUS initiative, this initiative seeks to support faculty, students, and the greater undergraduate STEM education community by disseminating research and knowledge about STEM teaching, learning, equity, and institutional transformation. We invite you to learn more about the AAAS IUS initiative on our website and hope you will join our community as future contributors. You can also follow us on X, which was formerly Twitter, at I use program and LinkedIn to stay up to date on our latest events, blogs, or to share what you've learned at today's workshop. And now, without further ado, we will shift over to our first presentation of the day. I would like to welcome Dr. Eliza Riley, Executive Director at the National Center for Science and Civic Engagement. Dr. Riley, I will pull down my, my screen and hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Drew. And I'm going to now share my screen um, let's hope this works. No, sorry. Hello? Okay. Share content screen, screen broadcast. Okay. Does that work? Can people see? Looks good. Okay. Excellent. Um, and I should get rid of that. Okay, so my name is Eliza Riley. I'm the executive director of the National Center for Science and Civic Engagement, which is the host organization for CENSOR. And CENSOR stands for Science Education for New Civic Engagements and Responsibilities. Um, our mission is to empower responsible lifelong learners, both in school and out of school, who can apply the knowledge, values, and methods of science to the complex challenges facing our democracy. And we do that by supporting STEM learning that advances both science disciplinary knowledge and broader public, civic, and social contexts in which that knowledge was developed and implemented. Okay, let's go to the next. Whoops, whoops, next. All right, now I can't do my next slide. Uh, all right, sorry. Having a little trouble here. There. Okay, so Sensor was launched in 2001 at the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And that's, that's a key issue for us because this is um, liberal education and the context of liberal, liberal education is really where the whole thing started. So, um, Obviously, some of you know that, that um, George Q's high impact practices work was, was channeled through AAC and U, and, but, it, but that didn't really come out till 2008. And um, we, so we were, already, we were already sort of in place as a, as a, as a project and an organization um, before that. I just would like to say, sensor isn't technically a high impact practice in the usual pedagogical sense. Uh, it's basically more of a strategy that is overarching strategy for all STEM learning in various disciplines. 
and it it encourages faculty to do high impact practices. So while the high impact practices focused on the how of student learning, these were strategies and technologies and, and pedagogies that helped students learn or deeper students learning um, and, it, and sort of engage students because it, George Q is the, you know, the Nessie, he started the student engagement thing. Um, Basically, it's really about the strategy, the, the, I shouldn't say strategy, the, the pedagogies that in, engage students and in, enhance student learning. But Sensor always started with the why. For students, the question was, why do I need to take this course? For faculty, it's why do all of students, not just the majors, need to learn STEM? So Sensor was designed to address two problems uh, identified by deans and college presidents, particularly in 1999 when we did a, a survey. Um, one was attracting and retaining students to STEM courses. Um, Non-STEM majors never elected more STEM courses beyond general education. While STEM students frequently elected social science and humanities courses uh, very frequently. So the first college level science course that many students took was, was usually the last course they took. Secondly, STEM courses and majors were not retaining peers or persons excluded uh, for race and ethnicity or women. And this, this was, came from Elaine Seymour's um, very important study talking about leaving where she looked at why High, um, high achieving students who are minority students and women in particular left the STEM majors. Um, and Elaine Seymour was our first evaluator for the Sensor Project. Um, the other big goal was to reverse the trend of civic disengagement among college students as measured by basic knowledge of US government and participation in electoral processes. And of course, if you think of us being founded sort of or originating in 2000, approximately. Um, as Sandy Aston had come out with a study called The American Freshman, um, which he studied sort of a 20 year span, which showed a real drop in, in student participation and said just something simple like voting over the 20 years um, since the students, since the 18 year old vote was, was um, launched. So you can, I mean, I emphasize this because Sensor grew out of the liberal education tradition and premises of AACNU and of AAAS. Um, so two studies that were right front and center when, when those of us who were working on this project before it was funded um, were the, was the liberal art of science, Agenda for Action, which was a AAAS study, which I've got the, the link in there for people to look at. And a, and a book that came out in 1996, um, which was heavily um, sort of indebted and engaged with the Association of American Colleges um, leadership, Education and Democracy, Reimagining Liberal Learning in America. And this is a quote from The Liberal Art of Science, which was the 1990 statement from AAAS. Human survival and the quality of life depend on liberally educated citizens who are able to make informed assessments of the opportunities and risks inherent in the scientific enterprise. Yet there's every indication that present levels of scientific understanding are inadequate. In spite of the importance of science and the ubiquity of its application, science has not been integrated adequately into the totality of human experience. Therefore, it's the central premise of this report that science must be taught as one of the liberal arts, which it unquestionably is. So we really started with that idea that science learning or science teaching had not really been integrated adequately into the totality of human experience. So now we talk about what sensor is. Sensor is a project undergraduate, it started as an NSF founded project in, under the old um, CCLI um, program, uh, which used civic challenges of particular relevance to students to drive student engagement and persistence in STEM. 
So I, as I said, it was 2001 at ASCNU, funding from the National Science Foundation. It's a curricular improvement and faculty development program that's reached over 7,000 educators at more than 500 institutions. The NSF funded research has identified Sensor as a community of transformation in STEM. And this is a report that also is, is in this PowerPoint and can be looked up. This was a 2015, um, a research project by um, headed by Adriana Kazar, um, studying four communities of transformation, four actually communities of practice, including PCAL, BioQuest, Pogol, and Sensor. And it really basically made all of us look very effective and very good. And but it but the, the key issue here is that the effectiveness of these projects was in transforming faculty and transforming their practice. Once faculty started working with these projects, they really never went back to their old way of, of, of teaching. So Sensor is a curricular improvement initiative that was developed to do three things, engage underrepresented and, underrepresented and science averse students in science by teaching through issues of immediate relevance to them. Two, improve understanding and retention of science concepts by grounding those science concepts in real world contexts. Three, building civic confidence and capacity in students as evidence-based problem solvers and agents of change. Sensor approaches invite students to put scientific knowledge and scientific method to immediate use on matters of pressing interest to them. And at the top, you see, this is sensor ideal. So rather than having prescriptive pedagogies that we were trying to um, disseminate in advance, we had a set of ideals. The first one was putting scientific knowledge to immediate use on matters of pressing interest to students. Sensor courses explores the power of science to solve great problems, but also the limits of science to solve those problems by recognizing the complex political, social, cultural, and economic context in which science is practiced. Sensor regards learning as practical and engaged from the start, as opposed to an educational model that views the mind as a storage shed where abstract knowledge may be secreted for some unspecified potential use. So, from 2001 to 2017, the primary vehicle for disseminating this strategy were model courses that taught STEM disciplinary content through real world pressing civic challenges. And those courses were accompanied by intensive five day faculty development institutes and implementation support and mentoring in the, in the year following the attendance at the Institute. So the, 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 it's important to know that Sensor evolved from a single course, and I've got a spelling mistake here, um, a single course that was at Rutgers University in the 1990s when biomedical issues of HIV AIDS, which was formerly Bio 172, a standard gen ed bio course, taught most of the conventional content of intro bio through a focus on HIV disease, which at this time, when you think about the 1990s, was a global crisis. Using a contemporary problem to organize the disciplinary content helped students learn and retain complex biological concepts while deepening their engagement with and understanding of an urgent public health challenge. The pilot this pilot at Rutgers had, was funded by the CDC's Division of Adolescent and Sexual Health because they were very concerned about the HIV uh, problem and its potential impact on campuses. So the pilot demonstrated that college students were very interested in the problem and more willing to study the biology behind it when it was contextualized in a broader social cultural context. The NSF saw the potential of extending this approach to teaching STEM content to other disciplines and other unsolved civic challenges. And that's how Sensor was launched. So the, the idea of Sensor courses and programs was to change the focus of the STEM course from a sequence of abstract disciplinary concepts that students would learn from out of a textbook to immediate relevant and unscripted problem 
that demands STEM knowledge to solve. Some examples would be gen bio becomes biomedical estrus of AIDS, cellular and molecular biology becomes cancer, general chemistry becomes exposure to toxic chemicals, environmental bio becomes ecosystems of Southwest Florida or pollinators and sustainability. Upper division math becomes differential equations in real world context, uh, which was a modeling course. And here's just some of the early, early sensor models, um, which you get mysteries of migration, chemistry in the environment, brownfield action. Um, several HIV projects came out of this because it was such an important uh, problem, global problem in, in the, the early 2000s. So how does sensor relate to high impact pedagogical practices? Changing the content like this means changing the pedagogy. To effectively connect the STEM content to real world problems and, structure, and structures inevitably drew on active learning and engaged pedagogies, particularly undergraduate research, community-based learning and collaborative team-based assignments. These are, these are the high impact practice most frequently seen in sensor courses. All of the high impact practices have been used in sensor model courses. And I should remind people, the sensor models were not intended to be adopted as is. They were, they were de designed to inspire and to offer examples to people who would then create their own courses, but it showed people that this is possible. You can teach a high, um, a rigorous high quality chemistry course through up the problem of toxicity, the problem of water quality, et cetera. Um, Sensor is a major collaborator now with other STEM projects because we are compatible with other STEM strategies, et cetera. Et cetera. Right now we're um, partnering with the Accelerating Systemic Change Network, which is ASCN. We have longstanding collaborations with POGL, uh, the peer-oriented peer guided inquiry learning, uh, BioQuest Cubes. We've we've done several. We're a part, partner with them. We've done faculty mentor networks through them. CERC, which of course everybody does something with CERC. Um, NIST, which is the National um, Institute for Scientific Teaching, and the Summer Institutes for Scientific Teaching, which was the old um, the early Joe Handelsman project, which which now is a, a 501c3. Um, Pulse, the Partnership for Undergraduate Life Sciences Education. So we're partnering with all of those. So 23 years later, Sensor continues as new generations of faculty in all disciplines engage students in rigorous STEM learning through complex civic problems of deep relevance. Right now, and there's some wonderful Sensor participants who are in this meeting today, actually, Right now, the hot topics that, that faculty are working to teach their disciplinary content through, and it's all through different dif disciplines, climate science, that is really leading. We've got a lot of people working on climate science. COVID and emerging diseases, when the COVID crisis hit, so many of our participants and our practitioners turned on a dime and started using COVID to teach their disciplinary knowledge, particularly in biology, but, but other, other disciplines as well. Mathematics, for example, in terms of statistics, et cetera. Mathematics and information technology of redlining, gerrymandering, questions, you know, questions of voting um, have been used by math, math professors and um, IT and, uh, information technology and computer science faculty. Water quality is always a big question for sensor faculty. Right, right now we have quite a strain of, of researchers and teachers and uh, faculty with their students looking at wastewater epidemiology, looking at COVID and polio as they emerge in wastewater. Green chemistry is a new project that, that we're getting involved with through um, one of our partners in, in Texas. Ecosystems and sustainability, always, always a big topic. So if you're interested in joining our network, the easy way to do it is to go to ncsce, wildapricot.org. That's a gateway website to all of our websites. We have multiple websites. And it's also a gateway to signing up for our newsletter or looking at the meetings that we have upcoming, et cetera. Um, and so I have some questions for discussion, but we can save those for after the second presentation. And I will stop sharing 
now if I can figure out how to do that. Stop share. Okay, stop share. I did it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Riley. That was fantastic and wonderful. Um, now we'll kick it over to our next speaker, Dr. Oludari Owolabi, who's the Associate Professor and Principal Investigator at Morden State University. So Dr. Owolabi, over to you. Thank you very much for that kind uh, uh, introduction. And uh, we're going to start. Let me make sure that uh, we start here. And uh, all right. Okay, one more thing to do here to ensure that everything is okay. All right. So, welcome everyone. My name is Oludari Owolabi. I'm the, I'm the Director of Sustainable Infrastructure Development, Smart Innovation, and Resilient Engineering Research Lab at the Department of Civil Engineering, Morgan State University. Currently, we are uh, in custody of National Science Foundation. Uh, I use, uh, we have a project on the student engagement. And uh, so this is uh, one to look at the impact of experiment-centric pedagogy in relation with STEM undergraduate critical thinking, self-efficacy, and motivation. So today, uh, the few minutes ahead of us, we're going to have the introduction. Uh, we look at what is experiment-centric pedagogy, the core research questions that are addressed by this uh, study, the theoretical framework, then we look at the ECP module design, experiments and tools, data collection, and then we look at results. So there is an urgent need to increase minority representation in the STEM field. Uh, uh, motivation, self-efficacy, and critical thinking development can aid increased representation of minority and underserved population. So we see that. This can be done by having active learning, different active learning approaches. So different learning approaches have been reported to increase student learning and uh, engagement in engineering courses. So one of such intervention uh, strategies uh, is a high impact evidence-based experimental pedagogy called experiment-centric pedagogy. This has been uh, successfully utilized in promoting uh, motivation and enhancing achievement among Amer African Americans, especially in the electrical field. Uh, so what's so special about this pedagogy? So it is an alternative approach that allows students to learn at their own pace and in their preferred environment. That is, they can, because, because this uh, teaching techniques utilizes uh, uh, inexpensive, safe and portable electronic instrumentation system. That is, it can be used anywhere in the classroom, uh, for student demonstration in the laboratory or at home by students. So because it is uh, cheap, it is uh, just at the cost of a textbook and it is portable. Uh, so, and uh, actually we could see during when the COVID hit, it was very, the advantages of this uh, experimental centric pedagogy was manifested that we did not stop our implementation. We just ship the kids to the students. So that's one of those uh, uniqueness of this uh, 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 pedagogy. So the true integration of technology with the curriculum development allows students to learn through hands-on practices, experimental learning, and group work. That is to say, they can relate what is happening in the field due to what they are learning. So like, it was said, 
Initially, the goal of the ECP was to increase number of highly qualified and prepared African American engineers and all students to have a better understanding of technology and its role in STEM education and the policy associated with it. So some few years back, uh, ECP was uh, through uh, the National Science Foundation across 13 HBCUs, but just for electrical and electronics engineering undergraduates. And they were able to develop uh, uh, ECP and uh, well implemented. And according to Connor et al. 2017, uh, these were some of the highlights of the result from uh, from uh, from the from the research. It yielded more positive outcomes, like increased knowledge of instructional practices and associated outcomes, positive effect on prerequisite to learning, like attitude, motivation, interest in learning, engineering, positive effect on immediate effective outcomes of learning impact on recall used for in-course problem solving and module specific knowledge. Potential impact on long-term outcome, transfer of skills to new content, new setting and retention of uh, problem solving. So it was, uh, as, uh, it was utilized uh, across 13 HBCUs and it was supported by the National Science Foundation. It was also implemented. So now, to the best of our knowledge, we are the first now to now see that how can we diffuse to other STEM disciplines? How can we do that into the other STEM disciplines? Because it was only initially developed for electrical engineering. And so we were able to think and say, OK, because it uses inexpensive uh, instrumentation systems. And across all STEM disciplines, we, we measure, we, we learn concepts. And these concepts are relations between variables. And these variables are quantifiable uh, elements that can be measured. And most of the measurements that we do in STEM fields are used by electronic systems. In the medical fields, we use uh, heart rate or pulse. Or pulse. All, all those measurements are electronic systems. So because of that, that's why we were able to now see how we can now diverse it beyond the field of electrical engineering. So which includes civil engineering, we have talked about electrical, electronics engineering, industrial engineering, transportation engineering, uh, computer science, biology, physics, and chemistry. So based on that, we propose to the National Science Foundation that these were these research questions that we sought out to investigate. One. Does the experiment-centric pedagogy enhance student learning, motivation, and curiosity beyond the field of electrical engineering? How do the different STEM fields integrate and customize the experimental-centric pedagogy to meet the learning objectives of coursework within their discipline? Does an experiment-centric pedagogy increase the engagement of undergraduate students in their STEM learning and lead to measurable and lasting learning gains? How does the implementation of the experimental centric pedagogy impact student learning in the various STEM fields? So I want to, uh, for those of you that are eager to start to in, uh, implement this high impact pedagogy, in their teaching styles, uh, as you can see in this screen, in the screen here, on the screen right now, learning entails four phases, and learning can commence in each of any of these four phases that we can visualize here. But traditionally, learning has been uh, 
visualized to have commenced from math and science information phase. That is, talk of any concept that you want to teach. Maybe Ux law, for example. The professor will come to class and he will write some uh, relationship between uh, stresses and strain. And we tell the student that a gentleman many years ago postulated that relationship by what we call the Hooke's law. And then he will tell the student, now simulate a model, build, simulate it and do the experiment. So, but what experiment-centric pedagogy is saying that the first day of class, you want to teach Hooke's law. You don't start with the theory. Just come to class, give the students some experiments that relate stresses and strain. They perform the experiment. The students are curious. The students are motivated. They want to know why when I increase the load, the deflation increases. They are curious. They want, to, they, 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 they are motivated. Then after the experiment, then you now start telling them the theory. That is the second phase. You move to the theoretical phase, then the system model, the simulation, and the experiment. So that is what uh, the fundamental and what is the theoretical framework? It was based on the 5E model that implements constructivity theory in a structured way for teachers, in which the model consists of five phases, engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. So it implies the women's derived knowledge and meaning for their experiences. So students can reconcile new information with prior concepts by comprehending and reflecting on the activities, highly engaging, high impact. So for the ECP, we have, this is the mod module instructional design. So you identify uh, concepts that are very abstract, that are difficult to understand, then you create a model. So in that model, you have five segments in your instructional, instructional design. You have the information about the model. That is the model title, then placement within your curriculum, uh, which is your primary or secondary uh, audience, the standards or for those of us in engineering, we have the ABET outcomes that you want the student to learn maybe ability to perform experiments or ability to interpret or apply a math and science. So then the prerequisites and the context. Then you have the purpose of the model. Then you have the questions, then the module objectives, then the instructional process, well articulated, materials needed, the procedures, the formative assessment, the summative assessment, the differential instruction, and the alternate plans, and then reflection. So that is uh, uh, basically the ECP module instructional design. So as we have said, it's a very valuable STEM teaching approach because using electronic instrumentation to make scientific is common in all STEM disciplines. So what do we do? How can we do that? Like I said, look for these concepts. And most of these concepts are relating one variable to another. And these variables are measurable. So you investigate whether this uh, is a sensor or a probe. For example, in this, it is about relating stresses and strain. That is a string gauge. Then you connect it uh, to a circuit, maybe using breadboard, and then you connect it to a microcontroller. You can either be ADLM 2000, Arduino, just for signal conditioning, 
and for processing the data. And then you have the display by which students can now see how, if you increase the load or oxygen demand or light, whichever a variable that you are trying to investigate. And then you can also have it through the data logging. So these are a few experiments that we have uh, developed uh, and conducted, uh, specific heat of solids in industrial engineering, uh, so sound and noise monitoring in civil and uh, transportation engineering, heat engines in industrial engineering, and that's a mobile sensor there. Uh, that's uh, one of the setup for the industrial specific heat of solid. And then uh, that's for uh, in biology, heart rate. Uh, the, to the right is a blim deflection in civil engineering. Uh, that's the trans sound experiment, uh, reaction time, traffic count, traffic control and devices. Uh, these are soil moisture content in soil sensor uh, for, for biology, uh, for for light sensor that can monitor photosynthesis, uh, how the rate of uh, application of light increases the photosynthesis of the plant and increases the growth of plant. It can be monitored using the, uh, the light sensor. So in physics too, we did some other experiment. And uh, from spring, it was, we started the implementation in spring, it's still, uh, is it, at the fourth year right now, but so far, a uh, number of students imparted uh, from spring 2020 to spring 2022. We are still gathering the data for this year. So in biology for courses, number of faculty, so we have imparted uh, uh, close uh, about 2000 students, a majority are from uh, uh, minority uh, African, they are African American. So, and uh, that's a very, very, uh, we're going to look at some of the design. So what do we do? The research design. So we, there is a pre and post test design, a mixed method, quantitative and qualitative. So we, we normally had uh, uh, workshops where we would train the faculty and the, and the graduate trainees in order to implement, collect data, and uh, do classroom observation, uh, module selection, curriculum uh, uh, development. So now we have to collect the data. So we administered pre and post survey using a validated instrument called the Motivated Learning Strategy Questionnaire which was adopted for collecting learners self-reported motivation and learning strategies. So uh, the instrument has soft skills that are used for collecting their soft skills, intrinsic and intrinsic motivation, tax value, test anxiety, peer learning and collaboration, expectancy components, metacognition and critical thinking. So what we do is before and after uh, we, uh, we administer this questionnaire and see uh, some of them are from Leica scale one to seven and see what is the gain and skill adapted before and after the implementation. And then another thing is we introduce Classroom observation protocol for undergraduate STEM students developed by Steve Eton in 2013, uh, which uh, measures uh, faculty effectiveness rubrics, virtual and face to face. So that uh, instructors and the teaching uh, practices they employ play a critical role in improving student learning in college uh, uh, courses. So so to facilitate this process, uh, Tim Smith et al. Uh, introduced a classroom, a new classroom observation protocol, known as the classroom observation protocol for undergraduate STEM or corpus, uh, was de developed. And the protocol allows STEM faculty 
after a short 1.5 hour, uh, hour training period to reliably uh, characterize how the faculty as students are spending their time in the classroom. So there are different attributes. What are the students doing? What is the instructor doing? during the 50 minute uh, period. So we have what we do, the observer, we go to the class and start uh, every two, two minutes, every two, two minutes, what is the student, what are the students doing? What is the instructor doing? So these are some of the attributes. Listening to the instructor, student asks a question, individual thinking, uh, presentation, then instructor, lecturing, real time writing on board, on the board, board, asking a clicker question, listening to and answering student question with entire class uh, listening, showing or conducting a demo. So these are some of those things that, uh, and waiting when there is an opportunity for an instructor. So that's what we will do. And we are going to see some of the results shortly and see why uh, this is very important. It's a feedback. You can see the traditional teaching is just, the professor is just lecturing and the students are just listening. And I imagine during the COVID-19, when we all went to Zoom, you don't know the student will not turn on their camera so how, are you, how do you know that you are effectively engaging the student? So, so like I said, the good thing about this uh, uh, pedagogy is that we were able to do it both on-site on and virtual. Uh, the, uh, the picture below, that's where you see students in, uh, in the industrial engineering during COVID, during the experiment from their homes. The, 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 the kids were shipped to them. And uh, we, so, and the, uh, the instructor too was in his house. So, so that's the good thing about the experiment centric pedagogy. As was mentioned, we had in uh, several disciplines. So, what we did was to look at concepts in each of these disciplines and courses where ECP will be implemented. For example, civil engineering, concept of vibration of civil engineering systems, bridge vibration, bending of the cantilever. These were those courses. Then computer science, computer architecture, digital designing, computer logic. So computer architecture and digital logic. In fact, they were so happy because most of these courses were just taught theoretically. So we started implementing in computer about two, one and a half years ago. So we did the full other, uh, the subtractor. The student was so happy. The faculty was uh, very uh, uh, satisfied that they said they wanted more. So physics and engineering, physics, uh, chemistry, electrolysis, uh, analytical chemistry, exothermic and uh, reaction, and then biology, bio cells, oxygen cell, uh, photosynthesis, industrial engineering, uh, heat exchange, transportation system. So these were the concepts, these were the courses, and these were the discipline. And now we are also diffusing it in, in the Department of Mathematics. So these are such a, uh, some implementation uh, photographs where students were well engaged in it. So I will just to present some of the results. We are in the handout you'll be given, we have dis disseminated the, our findings in about 21 articles. And at the end of this uh, presentation, uh, there'll be a QR code that you can just uh, take the pictures and see all these papers. So, but I just want to look, uh, just uh, show some of the results from some of the at uh, the TRB 2022 Transportation Research uh, Board Conference, development and implementation of experimental centric uh, learning experiment in transportation 
during the pandemic and beyond. So like you said, we uh, implemented uh, noise measurements uh, in the noise uh, for the uh, uh, experiment uh, to let students understand the concept of noise in transportation. You can see that there is a logarithm function. So it does not depend that, for example, noise is measured in decibels and when the traffic volume doubles, it does not mean that the, the sound level will double. So, so that's one of those concepts in, uh, like you are seeing here, uh, sound twice as loud as B, sound twice as loud as B, sound as loud as B. Also various, uh, the volume of the traffic, the speed of the traffic, so that students can be able to understand and also the moisture content uh, using Arduino and the moisture uh, content sensor. So these are some of few of the results uh, in all these uh, changes in student uh, motivation constructs uh, from the MLSQ result for the pre and post. Uh, so these are the percentage changes. Uh, I'm very interested. The one you read was uh, a positive change. In a class like this, I prefer uh, course material that really challenges me so I can learn new things. I am very interested in the content area of this course. I like, I like this subject matter of this course. So uh, we had uh, in all those three, also impact on self-efficacy, uh, critical thinking, uh, metacognition, Peer learning and uh, peer learning, so a very great uh, impact. Then impact on curiosity, uh, in, in, interest, uh, curiosity. When I learn something new, I would like to find out more about it. And then we have uh, deprivation. So those in reds are where we have a very high percentage uh, uh, gain. So we can see in metacognition, if course material are difficult, I change the way I read the material. So about 28.6, uh, peer learning, about 28.6. And here is also another result of the study that shows us uh, where we are able to see various constructs and then pre and post uh, the standard deviation and the significant value. So anything that is uh, less than 0 0.05, that's very significant. So metacognition is significant here. 0 0.046, uh, peer, peer learning collaboration is very is significant. So there is a real appreciable increase, significant increase in students' metacognition due to the application of this pedagogy and in student peer learning and collaboration. So, and uh, this another, uh, the combination for four, for all, all of those uh, classes there. And then just this, uh, now put it in a, in a, in a Z plot where we see the, uh, the mean score, uh, the mean score and uh, the post and pre. Uh, expectancy component and test anxiety, metacognition and critical thinking, peer learning, collaboration and interest, epistemic uh, curiosity, uh, this uh, pre and post. So intrinsic goal orientation, post and pre, expectancy component, critical thinking, metacognition, peer learning, interest, uh, epistemic curiosity. So. Now, the classroom observation. We found out that the lab session was very interactive and it was clearly observed that the students were effectively engaged. They were excited about the experiment as well as highly uh, inquisitive about the procedure. So we're going to see some of the results shortly. And the COPU result about ECP is highly engaging as students spend 84% of the class time on hands-on activity, while simultaneously 92% of this class time was spent by students asking questions. Actually, 
when we first of all implemented it during COVID, the professor, it was the end of the class, the end of the semester. The professor was so excited that, wow, thanks to ECP, I never saw the student open their camera. But because there is no way you are excited, you are implementing it at the covers of your house, you have to open the camera. So it was highly rewarding. So these are a few of the uh, 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 the corpus results uh, in some of those classes, transportation class, uh, lecturing, uh, instructor doing, uh, then uh, what uh, learners are doing. And then, so here we let you see what we are talking about. So in red, in blue is ECP. In orange is non-ECP because we observed the class when ECP was implemented and when ECP was not implemented, like the, uh, like the traditional uh, classroom. You can see here, during that period, 96% of the students are listening, uh, but you may, do you know whether they are listening or not? But look at with ECP, more of the activities are students are asking questions. Uh, they are answering questions. They are doing some assigned group activities are going on, uh, engaging the whole class. So more of that. So that shows that it is an impact pedagogy and highly engaging. So then here, that is what, uh, uh, so, what the students are doing, let me, sorry. So here, what the instructor is doing. So this is what the instructor is doing. So here we can see for non-ECP, just lecturing. But majority of the time here, instructor is answering question, is following up feedback. So it's, uh, can you, see, you can see here that that is, uh, what and uh, that's what we have said. Corpus result revealed that ECP is highly engaging as students spent 84% uh, of the class time on hands-on activities, while some 92% of the class time was spent by students asking questions. Also, we look at the grades of the student, grade distribution prior uh, to when ECP was implemented. We could see here that uh, 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 the pass rate was high. Also, we look at the outcome assessment and see, uh, describe the hypothesis ability to the students and see what uh, ECP has been able to achieve. So that's uh, outcome assessment. And then uh, we did the qualitative analysis, look at the learner's feedback from the open-ended questions. We can see some of it good, enjoyed, uh, intriguing, interesting, uh, some of these things. And uh, so ECP has been demonstrated to improve student motivation and achievement of the stated uh, learning objectives in transportation and all other fields. So this material is based uh, upon work so supported by the National Science Foundation under the grant the opinions, findings, and conclusion or recommendation expressed are those of the, are do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. Uh, at the breakout room, we are going to have this discussion, but I will put this, uh, this is a QR code that anyone can take the picture or that, and that will assess all the publications, about 21 of them so far that have been disseminated through this, uh, uh, I impact pedagogy. I thank you for your audience. Thank you all and God bless. Incredible. Thank you so much, Dr. Awolabi, for that wonderful presentation. So at this point in the workshop, we are going to transition to our breakout sessions for Q&A and further discussions. So the way that this part of the workshop is set up, each facilitator or each presenter will have their own breakout room. You all can select which one you would like to attend for further discussion and Q&A based on their presentations. 
they're coming prepared with discussion questions and it's meant to be more of a conversation and each are also brought an additional facilitator to help with the conversation. As mentioned, breakout rooms are self-assigned and organized by speaker. At this moment, I'm going to open up the breakout room. So you should be seeing that pop up on your screen. So yep, you should be able to see a pop up allowing you to select a breakout room. If you do not see that pop up, you can navigate to the bottom of your screen and select the breakout room buttons and click the room you'd like to enter. If you're running an older version of Zoom and don't see the breakout room button, please post in the chat which speaker's room you'd like to enter and we'll assign you in that room. So I'll be staying here in the main room and can help people get to the place they need to go. And we will call everyone back together around 325 for some closing remarks. So again, thank you all so much. And I hope you have a productive discussion and we'll see you soon. Super, I hope everyone had a fantastic discussion, a good little 30 minute chunk. And I was wondering if our speakers, either the speakers or the facilitators that they brought along, would be willing to share a quick one minute recap or just a few highlights of what you all discussed during your breakout groups. And I was wondering if Dr. Riley and uh, Jayla Bob, if you two would be interested in starting. I, I'd be happy to, and I was very fortunate to have Jay as somebody who's worked with us for so many years. and who could expand but both basically we got questions that were very direct questions about how you implement sensor courses and the difficulties of of aligning the the um the curric the existing curriculum with this new strategy and how hard is it if you're teaching in a section or you're teaching a a sequence that might not align we do have answers for those things and we have lots of examples of what people the the results they got the the, the concern about content is maybe somewhat overblown um, because retention goes up, even though the amount of content might be not going down, but it would be reduced and in, in integrated and embedded in a larger, a larger idea. We also got stuff about uh, questions about how we actually do the faculty development. Um, somebody called it onboarding. How do, how do we, how do we imagine, how do we get several students students, faculty, several, a group of instructors sort of working together so that they can actually implement a curriculum that makes sense. They're not the only practitioner. Um, and Jay might have some other, and he had lots of other examples of, um, of why, basically though, I didn't really go into it, but sensor isn't just made up out of the blue. It actually was drawn drawing on because we started at ASU with the with the best research that was available on student learning, and it it, it drew on many many reports from the National Academies, from AAAS, from the Nas National Science Foundation that basically people knew about but just hadn't implemented. So so the 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 recommendations or the, the strategies we were doing was just saying here's a way to actually do some of the things people have been talking about for decades. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you for that recap. Um Jay, anything to add? Oh, I just show up mute. Yeah. I I think the only other thing that people were bringing up is in multi-section courses, when you have somebody who's doing this approach and other people who aren't, how, how do you begin to spread this? And, and, you know, this is both a systems and a cultural set of problems, and it requires a whole lot of thinking that we talk about in more detail during the uh, session. But in multi-section courses, this is always a problem. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. And then we'll switch over Dr. Owalabi and Lumi. Any highlights that you want to bring up from your breakout? Uh, we have a representative, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. So um, the two goodly gentlemen thought that I should speak. So um, one of the first things that um, came up was, oh, how are students um, responding to the ECP um, in terms of sharing and um, letting other students know about the experiences it could have, like, are they helping and promoting? And I learned that, yes, uh, some of them became evangelists and certainly um, having taken one course where this approach is used, they want to come back and take more while also um, encouraging friends um, to, to join. Um, we also, um, Pelumi, can you, just read that first question that you had, um, and, and then I'll respond to it. The first question on your list. Mm. 
when we need to go off mute. Uh, okay, thank you so much. <laughs> so the first question was centered on how do you think we can adopt ECP in building the work? Oh, that was the second question. The second one was how to build, uh, use ECP to build a workforce pipeline. That was the second question. The first was centered on, um, I think I'm trying to grab the screen on it now. Oh, it was Professor that shared it. Dr. Willaby, do you? How can awesome pedagogy, awesome pedagogy be, adapted be adapted and optimized adapted to cater to the changing landscape of post-COVID education, sure, including I'm... online, hybrid, and in-person learning environments? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so somehow finding myself being the person on the spot in the breakout room, I shared that I thought, you know, um, coming together, um, uh, coming together among the scientists, the um, people in education, folks in, you know, centers for teaching and learning, including um well, here we call them um, digital learning staff, like putting our heads together. But I think there's also a piece in terms of scaling up that folks in higher admin um, need to help out with, like in terms of the, the funding. Um, the other question, which had to do with um, implications like for workforce development, um, career development, access to work, um, I'm interested in that too, because I used to be a career counselor. And so I thought that making visible the richness that's happening in these classes in terms of authentic learning, um, and perhaps that might involve career counselors and um, others in, in such units that do a lot of um, outreach with um, industry, you know, it could be a collaborative effort to make this visible. And then also I was thinking that based on the fact that the students are doing a lot of rich work um, that's hands-on, but also doing this metacognitive work, perhaps um, developing e-portfolios and so on, um, being encouraged to do that, but equally also the institution making or, or departments making um, this rich work visible to the um, hiring community, so to speak. Hey, thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate you uh -huh. coming up on the spot to contribute <laughs> there. Um, and I see we're running just a few minutes over, yeah. but I want to, Lumi or Dr. Wolabi, any thoughts you'd like to add before we transition to some closing remarks? Yes, it's just, uh, I'm so excited and delighted to have this opportunity to disseminate what ECP has been. It's all about engaging the students so that everybody can learn uh, STEM, you, you know? And I wish that this can be uh, uh, brought down to starting from the elementary level so that we can have a very uh, diversified uh, STEM uh, pipeline that we come into the university. So hands on learning is very, very crucial. Thank you all and God bless. Uh, I echo that it was a really great opportunity and it was wonderful to meet some of the people in a smaller setting in the breakouts and to get those questions. Um, and of course, you know, I think our contact information should be available. Um, Drew, is it easy to see our emails and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Yep, we can. Okay. Um, yep, if people feel free to drop it in the chat if you'd like to, if you're comfortable with that, and then we can also be sure to include it on the workshop page, which I saw a question in the, or I saw something in the chat that asked about discussion questions. Um, both the presenters included their discussion questions in the slides, so we have the full slide deck from today that's available online on the workshop page. So be able to find the discussion questions there. Great, and if you would update mine, because I've added a couple of slides, and somebody asked me why it wasn't on the one that's on the on the thing. So yeah, I just added a page of some resources that people were looking for. But yeah, if you, I, I embedded our our um, sort of membership interface uh, just website into the into the slide deck. So you just have Great. to click on it. Well, cool. yeah, we'll get that updated and ensure that everyone here has. The most recent information. Well, I know we're a few minutes past, so I just want to thank our speakers today, our facilitators, everyone who contributed 
contributed and the rest of the AAAS IU's team and all of you who are able to join and participate in the workshop today. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And as one of my colleagues posted in the chat, we have a survey, survey link that is available in the chat and will be sent via email as well. It should only take a few minutes, but the feedback is certainly very much appreciated. So we can continue to do engaging in important discussions as the ones we had today. So again, thank you all so much. If you're interested in another IUS, AAAS IUS workshop, our next one will be on Tuesday, October 17th. That topic will be course-based undergraduate research experiences, incorporating STEM research into the curriculum. And from again, from behalf of our speakers, facilitators, all of us at the AAAS IUS community, thank you so much and take care. Thanks everyone. Thank you.